Welcome to the Semi-Interesting Podcast, where we explore some of the unique legal issues in the global semiconductor industry. My name is Nathaniel Lusak. I'm an IP attorney at the law firm of Hodgson Russ and one of your hosts. I'm Elizabeth Morris. I'm an IP attorney and director of intellectual property and products at Pure Storage in Mountain View, California, and I am one of your hosts. Semiconductor capital equipment, the tools that make chips, are complex and expensive machines. And the near nonstop heavy use means that there's constant servicing and you need replacement parts. Those of you in the business will probably not be shocked to learn that fabs don't always want to pay for official replacement parts during that servicing. And even if the tool manufacturer argues that the replacement part is better than a third party knockoff, the fab, after looking at the price difference, still might disagree. But for some of these replacement parts, it's difficult to gain utility patent coverage, which leads to the question, if there is a way to protect the shape or ornamentation of the part itself. And what if I told you that there is? Today, we're going to talk about design patent protection relative to replacement parts and consumables with my colleague, Charlie Rauch. Charlie, thank you so much for joining us today. Could you start us off with a quick introduction? Of course. Thank you so much for having me on the show today. My name is Charlie Rauch. I am a partner at Hodgson Ross. I am the practice area leader for design patents at the firm. By training electromechanical engineer, a significant part of my practice is with respect to design patents. I represent everyone from some startups to Fortune 500 consumer appliance manufacturers, the third or fourth largest consumer electronics manufacturer, and some medical device companies, life science companies as well with respect to their design patent issues. So happy to have you here today. I'm personally quite a big fan of design patents, so I was excited when Nathaniel got you to, to come in. I would like you to be able to tell our listeners who I think, you know, a lot of patent practitioners do only utility patents, right? So can you give us a brief introduction to design patents and describe what the difference is between a design patent and a utility patent? Of course. So a design patent protects the ornamental appearance of an article of manufacture. Uh, this can include two-dimensional factors or features, patterns, lines, color, three-dimensional features such as the shape of an article. Uh, obviously, in contrast to a utility patent that goes to the function of a product or method thereof. So design patents themselves are just, well, mostly just pictures. How is this similar to or different from trade dress protection? Sure. So the thing about trade dress protection, it's a source identifier. So what is, it's acting as a, as a trademark, essentially. In contrast to design patent, there's no need to show sort of recognition by consumers. Confusion between consumers is not relevant. The quality of a product is irrelevant. It's not acting as a source identifier. Instead, it's, it's really what you're protecting is the appearance of a product. And that included a functional article. And by definition, when we think about industrial articles, they all have function. So um, when people get concerned about functional articles being protected, by definition, an industrial design is always going to be protecting uh, a functional article. So that's, again, very different than trade dress protection, where functionality is something you really need to avoid in terms of protection. So this difference between functional and non-functional, sorry, I'm going off script here a little bit, man. But when we're looking at design patents, it has to be non-functional, right? And I feel like I've heard the case back maybe in law school, like you can't get a design patent on like a key because it intentionally is used to unlock a lock. So does that limit the ability for a state semiconductor fabrication or other semiconductor companies from being able to use design patents? How do they navigate those rules? Yeah, of course. So functionality is always a very murky area and people are always concerned, as I mentioned, about the protection of a functional article. So there's really two areas that functionality can come into play with the design patent. And the first is stash choice subject matter. So under section 171, you're protecting the ornamental appearance of article. And so like you referred to the best lock decision, which is really the only decision that's come down on this on the subject. And the question is whether or not the overall design is dictated solely by function. It's the only design that can achieve a certain function. 
So if you have a design for a key blank in that case, and it's the only design for a key blank that can fit into a also patented lock, which is a unique circumstance in that case, because in the best lock decision, not only were they seeking protection on the key blank, but they already had an issued utility patent for the lock. So this was the only blank design that could fit into the lock. And so the court said this is ineligible for protection under section 171 because it's the only design that could achieve that result, right? You can't design around it. Now, I will respectfully disagree with the Federal Circuit's decision in that case because you can make the key bank look different than what was claimed. I mean, it was only the portion that, that was claimed you could have cut maybe holes in the key blank and it probably still could have functioned to unlock the, the lock. It could have put some sort of graphic on the key blank and it still could have functioned. So I think that's a pretty unusual case that you could say that the overall claim design is dictated solely by function. It's just like I gave examples of how could you design the key blank perhaps differently and, and that's how a patent owner is always going to defeat that challenge of functionality. The first of sort of two areas. The second is, is claim construction. So in claim construction, the defendant's always going to argue, well, you can't seek protection for functional features. And so these features should be perhaps de-emphasized or ignored, or we should place less importance on them because we should focus on the quote ornamental features. Now, again, that's a very murky area. There's case law that sort of confuses like the more Norwich factors, which are from trade dress with design patent claim construction issues. But the good cases will basically point to the fact that every design has a functional aspect to it, right? That is by definition an industrial article. The fact that the tool that you've designed has some sort of function is not going to disqualify it. Perhaps if it's a very broad claim or it's a claim to something that is a particular thread pattern for a screw or something like that, again, you're going to be able to likely show that alternative designs could achieve the same function. And so this concept of functional features not being protectable is truly a falsehood. And it really depends on, you know, I think the patent owner explaining to the court that the design or the particular features are not the sole designs that could achieve a particular function, offering alternative designs and showing the court that certainly these features are protectable under design patent jurisprudence. The claim is always right. The law as shown and described, right? It's very different from utility patents where paragraph long sentence that, that describes something. But then I remember in drawings that sometimes you could specifically put things in dashed lines to not have it be a part of the claim. So can you talk maybe a little bit about the drawings in design patents and how important they are or how you think about putting them into a design patent and, and the functions that they're creating there? Absolutely. So again, the design patent is a very short application, right? When we, when we apply for these and it's a short design patent. So the specification essentially lays out what the drawings show. And then your claim is the blending, right? The article of manufacturing trying to claim as shown and described. So, so your drawings are essentially the, the core of your claim. And it's, it is the claim. Beyond that, as you sort of alluded to, it's not just what is shown and described, but you could also show things that are unclaimed, right? So just like we can broaden or narrow the scope of protection with the utility patent by whatever the claim limitations that we include, the same is true for a design patent. And we do that through the drawings. So the drawings show an overall article of manufacturer, whatever that might be. And we can show in solid lines and shaded areas to indicate what is being claimed. And the areas that we don't wish to claim, we can show that in broken lines. And that's extremely important because what you want to do is obviously get your client the broadest scope of protection possible, right? We want to make it extremely difficult for your competitors to be able to make a product that is competing with you. So there's a lot of ways to do that. And typically what we want to look at is what is sort of the most essential part of your design. We want to make sure that that's claimed, right? And perhaps features that are easily revised or changed or altered and still compete with you are shown in broken lines. And there's also the ability in design patents to include multiple designs in a single application. And so for that reason, sometimes we'll include a first embodiment and maybe some, but all features are part of it. And maybe a second embodiment has additional features claimed and unclaimed. And so again, just like when we're crafting a quality utility application, with scope variance between your claims, 
you can do the same type of result with a design application as well. So is that a practice that you like to do to include more than sort of the standard, I don't know, six figures, like to actually show like multiple embodiments in the same thing? Or is that an unusual technique? For my clients, I'm always going to push to to make sure that we have scope variants ready in a single application. And you can also achieve that with a continuation application as well. So maybe you might say, okay, I have a not a significant design for us, but we want to make sure it doesn't get literally copied. We file an application to that. And then suddenly we see a competitor creeping in. We say, okay, thankfully this this application hasn't issued yet or or is about to issue. You can file a continuation to claim some difference in scope variance, right? And that's a common practice. The same thing with utility applications too, right? We might have a first patent that we get might be narrower than hopefully a continuation to broaden or change the scope of protection. No, I'm not giving Nathaniel any time to ask questions. In a situation where you are doing continuation, does it have to be the same drawings with like different things drawn in dash lines then? Or is it, can you do a whole new drawing? Obviously you need to show support from your original filing. So you're limited to the original filing that you had. There are some techniques you can have to maybe give you a little bit more wiggle room. So a lot of applications that I'll file, I'll file an appendix and the appendix might show additional views. It might show rendered views, whatever the client might have. And that can give you support for different types of applications that follow. You know, and you can even do the same thing off of a utility application. So sometimes you might file a utility application saying, you know, this is probably going to be a difficult case, right? We know the prior are. We'll see what the rejections look like and then face the music when we have to. If we see that from a utility perspective, this is going to be a difficult rejection to overcome. So you can follow a continuation off of that parent utility and try to protect the ornamental appearance of the product. If functional features might be obvious, let's say, that doesn't mean that the appearance of the product is also obvious. But you got to make sure the utility application can support a design application. So you want to make sure that you've got the standard seven figures, Perhaps some renderings also, again, depending upon what you want to protect later, you just got to make sure that there's support for, for that pivot in the future. So Charlie, we usually see design patents for things that consumers are using, furniture, toys, cell phones, well, at least the exterior of the cell phone or the, the operating interface for the cell phone. Let's say that you had an example, you had a graphite shield to go on the inside of a tool you needed to make it have a particular curvature in order to fit with the new design, to go in an aperture, or go at a junction between two different modules or whatever. Can you protect something so lowly as a graphite shield with a design patent? Absolutely. And I think that's, when we're thinking about consumables in the area of you know semiconductor tools, right? that's a great example of something that we know is a consumable item that's going to be perhaps easily knocked off. We can protect that and we can make it difficult for third parties to make replacement parts for that. And again, we're going to look at essentially what can we claim that's that's broad that's going to achieve the function that the graphite shield is going to accomplish, but perhaps make it more difficult by disclaiming other surfaces or features that maybe you can make a graphite shield fit your tool, but maybe not function as well too. And, And again, even though you have a functional advantage to your particular, you know, appearance or arrangement of the graphite shield. We can still make it difficult for someone to compete with you by filing a design application for that particular shape of the shield. You know, and and again, in in for semiconductor manufacturing and for all the examples you gave, you know, there's a lot of areas where you're not making money off of the razors, you're making money off the razor blades, right? Those consumables are going to drive sort of the revenue that you're, you know, for your business plan. That's where design patents can be extremely valuable and, and significant because, you know, the the razor blade might not be protectable with the utility application, or perhaps protection is very narrow. Um, design can make it very difficult, especially if it's if it's a consumable item that needs to interface with some other core item. That's I think the most valuable design applications and design patents. So that's exactly what we what we look for. Um, you know, my medical device clients in particular, that's an area where extreme interest and we file heavily on not just utility applications, but designs to try to make sure that we have great scope for them and make sure that there's not competition for the, that consumable market. Do you ever worry that design patents have such a limited uh, amount of time that they can protect in a space that you're actually disclosing your secret sauce to the world, and then you're not going to be able to later sell all those consumables that you actually want to sell. 
if you're filing a standard application, sometimes you know it's 18, 24 months until examination. So you're looking at 17 years. That's not too far off of the utility application as it is. There's also uh, continuation practice, something that for especially significant consumable or consumables in particular for some of my clients that they know the market for the product is going to be beyond the patent term, right? Beyond 15 years. What we'll do is we'll group in one application, many different designs, or perhaps designs that cover different aspects of the same product, right? At least the consumable, or let's say it's a multi-part or a multi-component product. And we'll file in one application, many, many designs and take advantage of the fact that under design patent practice or design patent law, the term is 15 years from the issue date. So what you'll do is you'll file designs A through G, let's say, get a restriction requirement because the designs are different, or you'll purposefully make sure that they're different enough in terms of scope that'll trigger a restriction requirement. And you file serially for each of those designs. So you get your notice allowance for A, and you'll wait until the last possible date that you can to file the divisional for design B and then design C and design you know, through G. And if you do it that way, you can extend your term well beyond the 15 year date. Right now, we've got a filing that I you know hope will get over eight years of additional patent term from A to G. So that's certainly a way to do that. Now, there is a recent case. It's a uh, Sonos and Google are fighting and the district court in that case sort of called into question continuation practice and whether or not there's a latches issue if you file a continuation to sort of protect something that's inspired by a um, market competitor. Now, I think if you're doing a filing where all the designs are grouped together at the time of the application, to the extent that Sonos doesn't get overturned by the federal circuit, I think it's a significant difference, right? In one case, you're waiting to file a continuation you're changing the scope of an originally filed application to try to target a competitor. In my example, you know what you want to protect. You filed all the designs together. It was originally presented subject matter, and that's why I triggered a divisional. And that's key also, because if you don't file the designs together at the time of filing, you're going to have to file a terminal disclaimer, right? And so you're not going to get that patent term extension because whatever the subsequent application is going to be limited to the parent expiration date because of that terminal disclaimer. It's pretty technical stuff. I'm sorry if I'm, I'm going too specific here, but I, I get very excited about the practice and hopefully this is useful for others to understand sort of how you can prepare an application that accomplishes sort of the new business needs. I mean, I could definitely see in this instance that you're talking about with the eight years that you're hoping to get, right? That's eight years potentially, you know, past the original 15. So you could be talking about more than 20, which is what you would get with a utility. Absolutely. Oh, I want to circle back on if you have all these figures at the beginning, like any utility patent, unless you request not, you get a publication at the time of filing. Is that true in design patents too? Like how do your competitors know about all those other figures that you filed? Is that still something they can see during prosecution or does that not come up? Yeah, it's a great question. So, so design applications, unlike utility applications, they do not publish unless it's a, it's a Hague application, which is a different animal. Until the design application issues as a design patent, it's not public. So your competitors can't see what you have. And so if you file a non expedited application, you know, you're probably looking at a couple of years until this becomes public. So I think that's, if you're concerned about you filing an application before you're coming to market and sort of tipping your hand to your competitors, that shouldn't be the case. In terms of, let's say we file an application with many different embodiments, you know, whether or not that's to take advantage of that continuation of divisional practice or not, that can be reviewed because once your parent application, the first file application publishes, then the file wrapper is going to be public. You can go in there and see all the other designs that are subject to the original restriction requirement. So they would be, you know, your competitors could do some digging and figure out, okay, we have these perhaps in the future to deal with as well. You mentioned that you can protect a design and whether you have one embodiment or 50 embodiments all on the same application. Okay. So you can protect an industrial design or replacement part. Why would you do this? I mean, what kind of damages could you exact out of a knockoff shop that's making replacement graphite liners or graphite shields? What kind of money would you be able to get out of them in a US court? So that's 
probably the most appealing aspect of design patents it is the unique damages uh, provision. So in utility land, you're looking at lost profits or a reasonable royalty in terms of monetary compensation for infringement. Now for designs, there's section 289 of the Patent Act, and that allows for disgorgement of your infringer's profits. So when we think about a reasonable royalty, you're looking at you know, typically a single digit or maybe even a fraction of a single digit of a royalty, depending upon the utility application, utility patent. Now, in designs, you're going to look at what the purchase profit is and profit margins are 30, 60, 100, you know, whatever, whatever your number is, but it's going to be significantly higher than any, any reasonable royalty. And this is why in Apple, Samsung, which in, in originally involved both utility and design infringement, disgorgement of profits was extraordinary. The original award being, you know, close to a billion dollars, later cut down to whatever, seventy hundred million dollars I have to look up the exact figure. But what was extraordinary about that is that you've got design and um, Apple Samsung involved infringement of Apple's design patents for its iPhone and iPad. And that included both the ornamental appearance of the exterior, but also the graphical user interface. So the icon arrangement, even though that there was infringement of utility patents as well, it, again, the award was, was really entirely because of the design patents that were infringed. Also interesting issues because now you've got a design patent that just covers, again, the, the exterior or the appearance of the front face, for example, of, of the iPhone or the iPad. Is it fair to award Apple disgorgement of total profits on the entire phone when the phone includes hardware, software, so much to it? Ultimately, the district court's um, award was upheld but that has kind of murkied the waters because now the Supreme Court, you consider whether or not that's fair and, and where do you draw the line, right? Now, a little history lesson on this. The reason why Section 289 came to be was because of some early um, design patent infringement cases involving um, infringement of rugs. And this were Supreme Court cases in the late 1800s where it was really difficult to show what is the value of a design relative to the article of manufacture, right? For these, these infringement of these designs involving rugs, what's the value of a pattern, right, on the rug? And if the rug might be purchased because it's high quality or because it's more durable, or maybe I am purchasing it because I think it's a really cool looking rug. I love that pattern of the rug, right? Well, what? how do you value that relative to the purchase price of the rug? It's really difficult to show. And so the the damages awards in these cases were pennies, um, although pennies back then are worth a lot more. But you know, it's still, it was an insignificant sum. And because of this, Congress stepped in and said, "Okay, well, for design patents, we're going to award uh, disgorgement profits of the overall article manufacturer, regardless of if there's any sort of apportionment." But the problem is again with apportionment. Going back to the Apple Samsung, is it really fair to award total profits on an entire cell phone? when your design patent is just the appearance of the exterior or just the graphical user interface. And so now there's a really convoluted multi-factor test to say, okay, is it fair to, to award a total profit on the article of manufacturer? What are you claiming here, right? Is it, there was another case in Florida involving infringement of a boat windshield. The infringer sold boats, not boat windshields. Is it fair to award total profits on the entire boat if the design patents are for the design of the windshield, right? But how do you separate the two? Because then ultimately you're going back to the rug case, right? That's why this is a, a complicated issue, but the default will always be total profit for the article of manufacture. So it is an extremely valuable tool. I think for things like consumables, it's pretty clear. Like you're not claiming the tool, like the semiconductor pool, right? You're claiming whatever the consumable is going to be. So it's less likely to be an issue, but I mean, you could have a design patent on your tool and or the exterior, maybe a portion of it, an end effector that's in the tool. And you can use the title, like I claim uh, whatever tool you're, you have, even though the claimed portion might just be the end effector in the tool, right? Or something very insignificant. But when we're drafting applications right now, that's exactly what we try to do is we want the big dollars, right? We want to claim whatever the article of manufacture is. And for that reason, it's significant. And there's some follow-on case law on this is that we want to make sure that our claim covers sort of the largest portion of our sales product, not just saying it's just 
the end effector, right? Let's try to go bigger than that and try to get total profits on whatever we can. Be in a position where you can claim, you know, the whole article and not just like a little component of it. Do you ever see pushback from the patent office where they say like you've overreached in your title or are the patent office examiners just so into the pictures that they don't look at the words? So I have a lot of things to say about patent examiners, but you raise a really interesting issue here. And it's actually more significant because of some very recent case law on titles sort of out of the blue. And, I, and this is, I know, not really answering your question, but I think it should be addressed because it's so significant and such a drastic change to design patent law. And I'm a design patent geek, so I get very excited when I have an opportunity to talk about it. There was a case called In Research Sold that came down a few years ago. And In Research Sold involved the design of a lip implant. The lip implant had a very, very simple design. It looked like a double-sided pencil, basically. So just a cylinder and two points on either end, nothing else. As basic of a design as you can think of, essentially. The examiner in that case rejected the design over a, basically it's an art tool that's used in like charcoal painting. Same shape. When we always think about designs, it's the figures, right? The title is sort of irrelevant. Maybe just like utility um, land, when we think of the title of an application being helpful to understand what your patent is directed to, but not limiting, just like a preamble and things like that, right? It's not limiting. It's just to direct the reader as to, you know, what are we talking about here? Drastically, the Federal Circuit said, well, no, this, this um, examiner's rejection is improper because you claimed a lip implant and the prior art, even though it's the identical design, is an art tool, completely different. And this is kind of open Pandora's box, I think, because now it's okay, well, if the shape exists in one space, then that means I can patent it in another. And some really interesting issues with respect to designs that might end up in the metaverse, for example, right? A digital representation of something that's physical, that's a different article of manufacture, right? And under a Surgicil, Federal Circuit's telling me that I need to patent that separately. So you'll see sometimes now practitioners even saying, you know, a claim that's not just the the article, but also a digital representation of the article to take a belt and suspenders approach to make sure that, you know, if you've got a sexy designer product that might end up in a video game, right? Um, let's make sure that we can allege infringement. And that's also why the more sophisticated practitioners will use an appendix to really maybe broaden or explain that the scope of the design can relate to many different things. So very interesting question on the, on the title. That wasn't exactly your question, and I, I got on a, a sidetrack. There. Oh, I was specifically asking about whether you get rejections on titles. from. Oh, under, yeah, understood. Yeah, so, and you will see some examiners say, like, this is a non-descriptive title, or an overzealous examiner might say, I can't tell what your title is directed to. It needs to be more descriptive. Although, if you look at the MPEP, it's, it, you're allowed to take a very broad title. You just can't say apparatus, for example. That's a, the example that I think the MPEP gives, so... So in your example about, oh, I have this sexy, let's say, shoe, right? And then I'm worried that it's also going to be, there's going to be a digital representation potentially later. Can you shove all that into your title or does that have to be in your appendix? Like how do people try to? Yeah. So, I mean, this is sort of a, a newer development. So I think the more creative you are, the better. So if you can say your title includes your shoe, it could be a toy or digital represent, you know, whatever you want. The more you can pack into a title, probably the better because, you know, Sir Dressel came down to your claim says, I claim a design for a lip implant, right? And so that's limiting. And then this surgical was followed by another federal circuit decision that was kind of controversial because similarly, it was the Kerber decision involving a design for a chair. And it was basically a pattern, right? A pattern that could be applied to a chair, essentially. Now, the same pattern appeared in a container. So like a box, basically identical pattern. And in that case, the Federal Circuit again said, well, you claim to chair, right? That's what your title says. This is not a chair, so no infringement. So again, as a practitioner, it kind of scares you because this came out of the blue for us. And you just got to think a lot more about how you're crafting your title. And going back to the surgical decision, sometimes, you know, maybe you want a broad title, maybe you want a narrow title because you don't want prior art to be hitting you. So mm -hmm. you have to think about where do you want to draw the line maybe, because if you think the pattern or the design or whatever you're trying to claim 
could exist in a different space, you got to make sure that your title perhaps more narrowly distinguishes, you know, what you have. So like in that example with the chair and that pattern, like going back to your talk about continuation, could you then change your title and draw the chair and dash lines and get to that pattern later? So if you've got support, right? So if your original application, perhaps in the specification or, or an appendix says, well, this could be a pattern for X, Y, Z, then yeah, maybe you can make that amendment or file a continuation for something that's cool different. You know, you could also imagine maybe, I don't think I've seen any examiner do this, but if you've got a title that is directed to more than one article, right, or one application of the design, are you going to get a restriction requirement, right? Are those distinct articles or those distinct designs? So some interesting issues that sort of are going to probably be litigated in the next few years as well. I mean, but you think that in order to get to potentially a design or design on a different article, you couldn't just draw everything in dashed lines and make a broader title, but you would have to have had more explicit instruction about that in an appendix. How much support do you need? And that goes down to the person having ordinary skill in the art, right? So if I look at the original filing, am I going to derive whatever that is, right? If I'm going to know that it could be something broader or not. And it's, you know, 112 has both written description and enablement requirements. So is there written description support for that amendment? You know, again, the, these are issues we think more about in utility than not your designs, but I think some interesting issues, especially because of these decisions, you're going to want to maybe potentially make some amendments or have to because of, of rejections that you're seeing. Yeah, that's really fascinating. So I'm going to change topics just a little bit and talk about international protections. So how can you take a U.S. design patent application and extend it broadly around the world? Uh, are there similar treaties to the utility treaty? Yeah, how does that work? Absolutely. So you got the Paris Convention, you're going to be doing the same type of priority claim, except for instead of 12 months, it's six months for that priority claim. So it is a shorter window. And you're not prohibited, perhaps, by filing a foreign application if you have a grace period like we have in the U.S. So you might be beyond the six-month window, but say, okay, well, maybe we don't need priority, but we can still file an application, which is kind of a unique situation with designs because of the shorter priority claim window that you have, the difference between six and 12 months. So very, very similar. There's also Hague application, which is kind of similar to a PCT, more like a Madrid if you're if you practice trademarks, but it's essentially a single application that you can designate multiple jurisdictions if they're a member of the Hague. I strongly advise clients not to file Hagues because of how different the practice is in each jurisdiction. I think the cost advantages that you see don't outweigh the potential harm or the issues that you might face by trying to file a single application that is going to cover the gambit of various jurisdictions, just because how different the practices are, especially U.S. practice is way different than everyone else. So in terms of the drawing requirements, the shading requirements, and there's just too many nuance and differences between how you know the rest of the world practices and us. And there's just a lack of uniformity, much less than you see in the utility world. And while that is an opportunity, I think I'd, we typically work with local associates to make sure that our application is going to make sense in the jurisdiction that we're filing. So then you kind of have to know, at least within six months, probably less, which actual countries you want to go into. That's right. Just jump in there. And are you then making different drawings? Like, I mean, I don't know specifics, but like, let's say Japan requires all this shading and U.S. doesn't want you to shade. So then... The opposite, though. Yeah, U.S. have shading and then the rest of the world doesn't really like the U.S. style of shading. So, you know, whether or not it's more like a wireframe or, you know, some jurisdictions don't want to see anything which then is very complicated because it's like, well, what's the shape? But that's their style. So some are going to be more lenient. A lot of systems are more like two generic systems where it's a registration-based system. So there's no examination as well. The fight is going to happen in litigation. So it's much faster. You file in Europe, file in UK. You're getting a registration within weeks sometimes, not years. So there's some benefit there too. It's much cheaper in terms of prosecution costs. You know, you have your registration. You know, in Europe, the term's even longer. You've got a 25-year term, extendable in five-year increments. So one application covers all of Europe, no longer the UK, but it's still a good bang for your buck there. So the design practice is so different. In Europe, for example, you can group as many designs together in one file, like as long as they fall in the same Locarno class, which is the classification system that they use for classifying designs. 
even though the articles have different shapes or whatever you're claiming, as long as it falls within the same classification. So huge advantages to your probably the European practice. It makes a lot of sense, I think, because especially for a lot of our clients, like waiting multiple years is unacceptable. Expedited designs are an option, but they're expensive. Well, at least they're much more expensive because you got to pay an expedited fee. You got to submit a search report to the patent office. So there's a lot more to it as opposed to a registration-based system. And then later you can fight over what the scope of your designs are, or if there's drawing issues, whatever that might be. Just a different way of dealing with prosecution. Do you ever advise clients to maybe start in Europe because they can have this big daddy application and they can get it in a couple of weeks and then you can figure out later whether it makes sense in the US? Yeah, I mean, definitely a subject, but it depends, right? Like if client's location is everything, right? Maybe you have an obligation to file in the US first. So that's something to consider, obviously. And I think in your scenario, if let's say we've got the opportunity, we could file in the US or we could file in Europe first, that there's not an issue with export control or getting a foreign filing license then there's not much of an advantage to filing first in Europe because you still have a six-month priority window. So it's not like I'm getting much of an advantage there. Back to trade dress. I feel like a long time ago, I maybe read that the Coca-Cola bottle had first been a design patent and then they were able to get trade dress protection. And then trade dress falls within category as trademark, right? As long as you continue to use it, it is continuous. So have you seen clients, maybe your own clients or other clients try to use design patent to kind of get over the hump into trade dress? Absolutely. And and that's a great example because sometimes we've got a design and we know I let our trademark experts handle the trademark side of things. But, you know, let's say we'll file a design application for a particular design and we want to also establish some trademark rights as well. Maybe we file the trademark application concurrently or shortly thereafter. You can show that exclusivity period. So if you able to get through sort of the hurdles of a prosecution, but because it's trade dress, you're not going to have secondary meaning off the bat. So it's not inherently distinctive as we know from trademark jurisprudence, but let's say you go on the supplemental registration because you can't show to get into the primary. Then having that 15 year period, at some point you can go from the supplemental to the principal register. That gives you that exclusivity window and make sure that there's not similar designs out there. And that's a great way to do things. It's sort of your belt and suspenders. And if you get on the principle, you can establish that you have trademark rights, that design is protected in perpetuity as long as it's being used in commerce. So that's much more valuable than, you know, if you're concerned about 15 year period for certain designs, then if it's iconic enough, then that's about as valuable as it comes. Do you ever worry about like articles that have the trademark, like the actual mark, not just sort of the shape that you might get in trade dress? on the product, then when you're filing that as a design patent, are you disclaiming or even removing? Like, how do you separate that trademark piece? Or can you get a design patent that has the trademark already in there as sort of an ornamental component? Is that a problem? It's not, not certainly not a problem, but I think most clients want to, you know, the infringers aren't also copying a part that is their trademark. So mm-hmm. infringers typically are going to try to to copy you, but not going to have the same logo, or let's say it's part of the design itself. You know, you've got a recessed portion with your name on it or something like that. So those are the features that we display. Sometimes we might not even show it at all, right? Just remove it if it's like a surface ornamentation for their logo. It's also come up the issue of infringement recently in like a serious case, because in that case, the question was whether or not the logo of the infringer should be considered in the infringement inquiry. So is that like a defense that, hey, I don't infringe because my products have a big logo on it and that looks different than what is being claimed in the design. Historically, of course, you would ignore the logo. We're looking at the overall ornamental appearance and you can't escape infringement by just slapping not Nike <laughs> you know, on, your, on your article. You're not going to escape infringement. But in that case, at least, the Fed Circuit right now is a stand is saying it's fair for that to be considered by the jury in an infringement inquiry. So for risky products, I was advising a client recently, I mentioned like, you know, there's some case law suggesting that if your logo is on there, that that's going to be considered in the infringement inquiry. If they, you think this is a close call, slap your logo everywhere, especially maybe if you can, in a way that it is part of the article itself. So having your logo that protrudes or recessed on a panel 
maybe you can escape infringement because of that aspect. So some interesting issues there as well. Well, Charlie, appreciate you offering some insights in terms of how to protect consumables. And if anyone has an iconic graphite shield, <laughs> how you can extend that protection indefinitely. Thanks for coming today and, and sharing your knowledge with us and hope to have you back after the next round of Federal Circuit cases uh, that surprise you. Yeah, there's one coming up, LKQ. Keep an eye on that one. It involves design patent, obvious. Now, but thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Yeah, looking forward to maybe another conversation once LKQ comes down on obviousness. Thank you so much, Charlie. I learned a lot today. Definitely appreciate getting into the details of design patent. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Semi-Interesting Podcast. You can find more episodes wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. And if you enjoyed the episode, we always appreciate five-star reviews. While we talked about legal issues, none of the information shared during this podcast is intended to be legal advice. If you have any questions about information we cover or ideas for a future episode, feel free to contact me or the other attorneys at Hodgson Russ. You can find contact information at www.hodgsonruss.com.